Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at this church. And I have the special privilege of delivering God's Word uh, to you all here this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open up with me to the book of Ephesians. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So again, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there with me. Otherwise, it'll be projected on the screens in front of you. And if I could kindly ask everyone to please stand and rise for the reading of God's word. This is a sign of, and an act of reverence and worship towards our Lord and the word that he speaks to us. Let me read this for us. This is God's word. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is God's word. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, we're continuing in our series uh, throughout the book of Ephesians, in this series that we've entitled uh, The Church, Grace Made Visible. And as we've seen it in just the first couple of weeks throughout the series, we've learned that the book of Ephesians is essentially a book that's all about the church. It answers a lot of questions about the church, like what is the church, how did God form the church, who did he put in the church, and how does God work in and through the people and the lives of the church? Those are all questions that Ephesians answers for us when we read this book. But specifically in this passage here today, the concept that the Apostle Paul is is answering and addressing is the topic of salvation. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to belong to the church and be saved by God? How does God save people? That's what Paul is answering in this passage here today. Now, I get it. Already, some of you might be thinking, if you've grown up in the church, "Ah, another sermon about salvation. It's probably like the hundredth sermon I've heard about salvation. Why can't we talk about something a little bit new, maybe a little bit more relevant to my life or the world or the culture around us? Now, salvation is so basic. And it is true on the one hand that salvation is one of the most basic, fundamental core doctrines of our faith of Christianity, and yet... At the same time, brothers and sisters, salvation is one of the deepest truths that you could ever grasp, ever experience throughout your life. See, on the one hand, salvation, it changes everything, the way you view yourself, the way you view your relationship with God, the way you view the church and other people. And salvation is a thing that it's meant to be, you know, when you're not a Christian or you're a new Christian, it's meant to be life-shattering. It's meant to be groundbreaking. And even if you've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years, it's also a doctrine on the other hand that if understood properly, if understood fully, it should never grow old. It should never go stale no matter how many times you hear this doctrine and grasp this doctrine. It's something that can only, according to the Bible, get sweeter for you and for me. And so friends, with that said, as we look at this passage together, there are three things that Paul talks about and describes about salvation that I want us to look at here this morning. First, in verses 1 through 3, we'll see the need for salvation. Secondly, in verses 4 through 9, Paul will talk about the method of salvation. How does God save people like you and me? And then lastly, in verse 10, Paul shows us the purpose or the goal of salvation. And so again, the three things that we'll look at in this passage, first, the need for salvation, secondly, the method, and then thirdly, the purpose of it. But let's begin with the first point. Again, if you still have your Bibles, if you read verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians 2 again with me, Paul writes this in the opening three verses, and he says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, brothers and sisters, What Paul is doing in these opening verses is he's essentially describing to us what life apart from Christ looks like. 
what fallen humanity apart from Jesus' grace looks like. How before Christ entered into your life, if you're a Christian, Paul says you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were enslaved, he says, enslaved to a lot of things. You were enslaved to Satan. You were enslaved to the ways of this world, the course of this world. And you were even enslaved to yourself, your own sinful desires. And because of all that, Paul says, the only thing you were deserving of in your life was wrath. You were, as Paul says, he literally says, you were a child of wrath, an object of wrath, something that was born for God's wrath. It's a very gloomy, it's a very depressing picture. But friends, here's what's so interesting. Paul is writing all of this to people who are already Christians, meaning he's not writing and saying all this to people who aren't Christians in the present trying to, you know, I don't know, evangelize to them or scare them by saying, hey, hey, you, look at your life. You are dead in your sins. You are dead in your trespasses. You're following the course of this world. And you know what? You are deserving of God's wrath. That's not what Paul's doing. Instead, what he's doing is he's talking to people who are already believers. And he's talking in the past tense. You were dead. You were once enslaved. Why? Why do this? Well, essentially what Paul is doing is he's essentially telling the church, look back. Look back at your life. And remember what you once were at one point in your life. Remember what you once were. In other words, remember what you once were and where you came from and how far God has carried you since then. In other words, the point that Paul is driving home is this. Remember how hopeless your life once was before you met Jesus, before he had entered into your life. And look back at that and see how far God has carried you since then. Remember how hopeless you once were without Jesus, how much you needed his grace back then. And therefore, how much you still need his grace right now. That's Paul's point. Look back and remember. Now, the reason that Paul is writing this in the first place is because he knows us as human beings, we don't do this naturally. It's really difficult for us to actually do this. And the question is why? If you think about it, if you've been a Christian for a long time, a short time, why is it so difficult to look back and remember what you once were? How far God has carried you? How much work he's done in your life? And be thankful for that and realize how much you still need his grace in your life. Why is that so difficult? Well, I think primarily there, there are a lot of reasons, but I think primarily there are two. First, you know, one reason some of us or all of us maybe have such a hard time doing this, looking back, remembering how far God has carried us is because some of us are still living as though we were dead. Now, some of us here in this room, we're still walking in the same exact sins that at one time in our life enslaved us. You know, although we've already been raised up with Christ from death to life, some of us in our lives, we slowly started crawling back, crawling our way back towards the grave because we've allowed sin to have such a large foothold in our lives. And in one sense, sin has almost started to re-enslave us, re-control our lives. And that's why a lot of theologians over the years, they've written countless books on how sin is very much like addiction in people's lives. You know, there, because there are a lot of similarities, if you think about it, between sin and addiction. And for example, when someone is addicted to something, the more they give into that addiction, the more they feed it, what happens? They want even more. It's the exact same way sin operates in our lives, isn't it? When someone is in the midst of an addiction, you know, a lot of times that person does not really have a clear grasp or sense of how addicted they are and why. Because whatever that thing is that they're addicted to, it's just a normal part of their life. It's become so ingrained in their life that they crave it, they seek it, and it's a repetitive cycle. And what Paul is saying is the same is true of sin. See, when you're entrenched in your sin, you never really have a full grasp of just how entrenched in that sin you are until you're brought out of that enslavement. See, it's only until you're finally brought out that you could finally look back and realize, oh my gosh. I had no idea how much this sin or this idolatry controlled everything in my life. And friends, for some of you here today, maybe that's your struggle right now. You know, there's a sin, there's a pattern of sin in your life that you have either struggled with or you've left unchecked for so long in your life. It's been such a long time that it's just become a natural, normal part of your life. Or maybe a normal struggle, even. But it's become such a normal part of your life. Whatever sin it is, maybe it's lust or greed or your pride or your self-sufficiency. And friends, if that's the case, just think about it. 
If that's the case, of course you're not going to be able to do what the Apostle Paul is saying in verses 1 through 3. Of course you're not going to be able to look back in your life and see, man, how far has God carried me? How much has his grace worked in my life? Why? Because what you've essentially done is you've basically crawled almost all the way back to where you started from. And that's the first reason that some of us in this room here today, we may struggle with doing what Paul says in verses 1 through 3. It's because we're still so entrenched in our sin. And because what sin does is it blinds us to our need for grace. And it blinds us to its own power. That's the first reason. Now, the second reason that you and I may have such a hard time doing this, looking back, remembering how much God has worked in our lives and being needy of grace is not, it's actually the opposite. It's not because we're so entrenched in sin, but it's because in your life, you look at your life and you, you think and you really believe and realize I'm not actually that sinful. Maybe you don't feel that sinful here today. You look at your life and you don't really think that you struggle that much with sin. And what happens is, you, over time, you start to get a little bit puffed up. You get a little bit prideful in either your own maturity as a Christian, longevity, how long you've been a Christian, <laughs> or your own growth, growth. And see, as a result, what happens is, you feel so far past You feel so far beyond what Paul is describing in verses 1 through 3. Yeah, like, that was a long time ago in my life, but look at me now. Like, it almost feels foreign. It almost feels, in some ways, offensive for Paul to associate you with what he's talking about in verses 1 through 3. And friends, here's the thing. Notice, it's the same issue in both groups of people. See, the same root issue is at work in both people because both people don't realize how sinful they really are. The only difference is the first group of people... They have allowed themselves to be so embraced to their sin that they don't realize how powerful sin is, how much of a hold it has over their life, and they don't realize how sinful they are. The second group just has minimized their sin so much to the point where they don't really see themselves as that sinful and that needy of grace. But both people are blinded to how sinful they really are. Now the question is, friends, for those of you who are in the second boat, in the second camp, here's a question for you. If you just think about it, what separates you? What makes you different from someone who's not a Christian before God? What makes you different? What makes you different from someone whose life is characterized by verses 1 through 3? Is it the fact that you don't commit trespasses or sins? Is it the fact that you don't really follow the course of the ways of this world? You never fall into the schemes of Satan? Well, no, according to the Bible, the only thing that differentiates you in your life from a non-believer. It's not the fact that you might sin a little bit less than those other people. But friends, it's the fact that someone has carried your sins for you. And that person is Jesus. That's the only real difference between you and someone whose life is characterized by verses 1 through 3. You know, to approach this from another angle, if we think about it this way, as believers, you and I, in in a sense, we are better off spiritually, aren't we, than someone who's not a Christian. Now, as we've been learning in the book of Ephesians, as Christians, you and I have been blessed with every blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, right? That's what Ephesians has taught us. And so in a sense, you and I are much better off than someone who doesn't have Jesus, aren't we? But see, what happens for a lot of us is over time, you start to develop this mentality that because you're spiritually better off than other people, over time you start to develop this belief and this mentality that you're actually a little bit spiritually better than those people too. Do you see how easy it is to conflate those two? You know, so often we look at another person or maybe a non-believer and we think, oh my gosh, dude, that person's life is a mess. They need Jesus so much. I mean, just look at all the things that they're addicted to. Look at the way they're living. Look at the way sin just has a hold on their life. They need Jesus. And so often it's so easy for you and I to forget that. We need Jesus just as much as that person does. And the only real difference between us and them is that we have Jesus in our lives. We already have him. We need him just as much as they do. And without his grace in our lives, we would be everything that Paul describes in verses 1 through 3. And that's the first thing that Paul shows us in this passage. He shows us our need for grace, our need to look back and remember how much of Jesus' grace we still need in our lives. This brings us to our second point, the method of salvation. If you read again with me verses 4 through 6, this is what Paul writes. In verses 4 through 6, he says, 
But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, what Paul is doing in the middle section of this passage is he's essentially describing to us the method of salvation. In other words, he's answering the question, how does God actually save people? You know, you have this sinner, someone who is an object of God's wrath. How does God save that person? How does he save people like you and me? Well, let's look at this together. In verses 5 and 6, Paul says that the way God saves us is by doing three things for us. Three things. And notice the repetition here. He says, God saves us by one, making us alive together with Christ. Two, by raising us with Christ. And then three, by seating us with Christ in heaven. What is Paul saying here? Well, Paul is saying that if you're a believer, when you put your faith in Jesus, when you believe in him as your Lord and as your Savior, everything that's true of Jesus, it becomes true of you. Just as Jesus was resurrected and raised from the grave, if you put your faith in him, the Bible says you've been raised and you've been resurrected too. Just as Jesus ascended back into heaven, and where is he right now? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. The Bible also says that when you put your faith in Jesus, you are seated there right with him too, right next to Jesus in heaven. Now, the question obviously is, how is this possible? How can this actually be true? Because if you think about it, you know, the last time I checked, looking out in this room, none of us in this room have died yet, and therefore none of us could have ever been raised from the grave. None of, in this room, of us in this room, as far as I know, have been actually literally to heaven. And so how can you and I be seated in heaven right now next to Jesus as God's right hand? How is that possible? And the answer is this. Although these things may not literally be true, at least not right now until Jesus returns again, even though they may not literally be true right now, they're legally true. They are officially true. How? What does that mean? You know, you often hear people say that Christianity is not a religion but it's what? It's a relationship. You know, people say Christianity is not so much about the rules or the doctrines and a religion. It's about relationship. And, you know, on some level, those people are right. You know, a personal relationship with Jesus is a very important aspect of Christianity. Can't deny that. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters. The relationship that you and I have with Jesus, it's not a regular relationship. It's what we call a legal or a federal relationship. In other words, what that means is Jesus is not just your friend, he's your representative. He is what theologians call your federal head. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, perhaps the best way I could explain this, best example would be one that all of us are probably familiar with, and many of us probably witnessed firsthand two years ago in the 2022 World Cup Finals between Argentina and France. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the game of soccer, <laughs> Uh, in soccer, in penalty kicks, what essentially happens is at the end of the game, the score is tied, and so the teams have to go to penalty kicks, right? What happens in penalty kicks is all the other players are removed from play. They're removed from the field except for one player. That's the person kicking the penalty kick. And what happens is that one player's performance counts for the whole team, meaning that if that one player scores, the entire team scores and the entire team wins. But if that one player misses... Not just that player, but their entire team, the entire coaching staff, all the fan base around the world, they also miss and they also lose. In other words, everything banks on that one player's performance. They're either victory or their defeat. It counts for everyone that they represent. And friends, what Paul is saying is that's the way that God saves sinners like you and me. He saves us by giving us, by uniting us to a perfect federal head, a perfect representative, one who lived a perfect life of holiness, one who fulfilled all of God's law, fulfilled all righteousness. And when you and I believe in him, we are united to him by faith. What happens is everything that Jesus accomplished in his entire life, his work and ministry, it's yours. It counts as yours. His victory is yours. You can celebrate in that because it's yours. His standing and status before God, it's yours. Everything that Jesus did, his holiness, his righteousness, his resurrection in his life, it's all made yours. He represents you. He gives that to you. Brothers and sisters, the beauty of, his, of this is 
that's not all. See, the reason that Jesus is the ultimate federal head throughout all of humanity is because he not only gives you his perfect record, his perfect performance in life, but Jesus is the ultimate federal head because he's the only federal head and representative throughout all humanity who not only does that, he not only gives you his benefits, but he's the only one who takes your curse, who takes your sins, who takes your burdens upon himself. You know, see, it's one thing in, in the game of soccer, right? It's one thing in the game of soccer at penalty kicks for one player's goal to be attributed to the entire team, and the entire team wins. But see, it's an, another entirely different thing when, let's say, every mistake any player has made on that team, every loss of that team, every failure that any t person on that team has ever committed, for all of that to be, just be attributed to one person on the team, the guy kicking the penalty kick. Now, to take it even further, it's one thing for... Lionel Messi, by the way, the goat of soccer, it's one thing for him, for Messi, to score a game-winning PK. And then what happens? All of Argentina around the world, all the fans around the world, they, they win. They celebrate because, because they won too. That's one thing. But see, it's an entirely different thing for all the crimes, all the infractions, all the injustices committed in and by the country of Argentina, every single person to be attributed to Messi. But see, friends, that's the beauty of the gospel. Because in the gospel, Jesus Christ does both. He not only represents you by sharing with you his benefits, all of his victories and what he's won, but he also represents you by taking on your sin, your brokenness, and your shame upon himself upon the cross. You know, perhaps John Stott, a former Anglican pastor, he once said it best when he said, if the essence of sin... The essence of our sin is us substituting ourselves, us putting ourselves where God belongs, at the center of our hearts, upon the throne of our hearts and lives. Then the essence of salvation is God reversing sin because the essence of salvation is God putting himself where you and I deserve to be, upon the cross. And friends, that is what Jesus does for you and for me as our federal head when we put our faith in him. He represents us not only by giving us all of his victory, but by taking all our shame and sin. That's how God saves you and me. Now, just practically speaking, before we move on to our last point, what does this mean for you and me? In other words, what effect should this have upon our lives as believers? Well, a lot of things, but at least for one, it should lead us to a very deep sense of humility and gratitude and thankfulness in our lives. You know, Going back to the, the soccer analogy, if you just think about this, what's the worst part about watching penalty kicks? What's the worst part about it? Why is it, in other words, so anxiety-inducing? Why is it so stressful, even if you don't cheer for one of the teams? Why is it so stressful? If you think about it, it's because you have no control. You literally have no control sitting on your couch, no matter how much you get close to the TV, watching, like cheering. You can't control anything that happens on the pitch. You contribute, in other words, nothing. All of it hinges entirely on that one player on the screen. And see, friends, because of that, that's not only true in the game of soccer, but it's also true in our salvation. You and I contribute nothing. And that's why when you think about it, when you and I live or believe as if somehow we contribute even a fraction or an iota of our acceptance, our approval before God. We contribute to that even a little bit. Well, that's the equivalent of, you know, us saying to someone after Messi scores a game-winning PK, that's the equivalent of us saying, hey, I'll admit, you know, Messi, he, he's a great player. He scored an amazing goal. He did all the work. But come on, who was it that was cheering him on so much from my couch? Who was it that was cheering for him and supporting him so much? That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? And yet, friends... The irony is, you know, how ridiculous does, do some of us look at points in our lives when in the Christian life we're tempted to think the same thing about our salvation. You know, we think and we say, yes, I know that Jesus, he died for me. I know that he was raised from the dead. He lived a perfect life for me. But, man, just look at all the things that I'm doing right now. I'm serving so much in church. I'm a leader in this ministry. I'm trying to read my Bible every day. God must love me at least a little bit more. He must look at me and be a little bit more proud, a little bit more accepting and loving towards me. And friends, in reality, what the Bible says is, you and I aren't even on the field 
We're not even on the field playing the game. In, f- in fact, it doesn't even say, it says we're not even ble- in the bleachers as fans. The Bible tells us we're in the bleachers as God's enemies. We're the opposition. <laughs> we're his enemies. We're cheering for the other team. And yet, what did Jesus do? He died for us. And he gave everything for us. He gave us everything that was his. And see, friends, when you don't understand that, when you don't understand the gospel that apart from Jesus, you contribute nothing to your salvation or acceptance or approval before God, if you don't understand that, then your life is going to be a constant lifelong battle with self-sufficiency, with pride, and with ego. Because you're constantly going to be trying to be proving and earning your worth before God, before other people around you in community, and even yourself. But friends, when you finally see, when you finally understand really that Jesus has done it all, there's literally nothing that you can contribute because you're just watching. You're just a bystander watching what he's done for you. When you understand that, well, friends, then you'll finally be free to rest in, to celebrate in, and live out of what Jesus has done for you because it's going to make you a more humble and a more thankful person. This leads us to our last point. The purpose of salvation. In the very la- that last verse of this passage, in verse 10, Paul, what he does here is he shifts gears and he explains to us, describes to us, what the purpose or what the goal of our salvation even is. And this is what Paul says in verse 10. He writes, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, some of you may know, and maybe a lot of you don't, but some of you may know that I served on the examination committee of our local presbytery here in Orange County uh, for the past several years, alongside some of our other pastors here at New Life. Essentially, what our committee does is we test and we examine future pastors. We test them in their doctrine, knowledge of the Bible, and we test them in their theology. And almost, I'm pretty sure, almost every round of examinations, one of my favorite questions to ask the candidates is this. Do Christians need to do good works? In other words, are good works, are they necessary in the Christian life? And the reason that I like to ask this question so much is, I'll be honest, deep down, I'm a little bit mean, man. (laughs) I like to see the struggle. I like to see the sweat, like, oh my gosh, how do I answer this? No, because here's the thing. If you think about this question, if you answer and say that good works are necessary for the Christian life, well, then the question is, are you saying, Are you saying you have to do good works in order to be saved? But see, on the other hand, if you say good works aren't necessary for the Christian life, well, then the question is, are you saying that we could just sin and live however we want? We don't have to pursue God or holiness? And so you see, it requires a very deep and nuanced understanding between the relationship of our salvation and the works that God calls us to do as Christians. A very deep understanding of the two. See, most times when people in the the church hear the term good works, they think of what? They think of good works in terms of the grounds of our salvation. In other words, that good works can never be the foundation, they can never be the basis or the reason why God saves us, right? And that's absolutely true. Good works are not the grounds of our salvation. They're not what save us at all. But here's the thing. What Paul is talking about here in Ephesians 2.10, it's not so much the grounds of our salvation. What he's talking about is the evidence of your salvation. The evidence, the consequence, the fruit of your salvation. In other words, what Paul is essentially saying is this. What he's saying is that the reason that God saves people like you and me is not because we live such godly, holy, and righteous lives, but the reason that he saved us is so that we would begin to. In other words, what Paul is saying is that God didn't save us because of our works, but he saved us for them. And what that means, friends, is if you're truly a Christian here today, if you believe in Jesus and have true saving faith, what that means is that in a sense, and let me say this very clearly, in a sense, good works are very necessary for you if you're a Christian because they're a necessary outcome. They're a necessary evidence of the grace of Jesus that is working in your life. You know, look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, what Jesus says is that if you've been made alive by his grace, If you've been made healthy and resurrected by his grace, what's going to happen? You will produce fruit. You will produce fruit. Now, that fruit doesn't make you healthy. It doesn't make you a good or a healthy tree. 
But if you're a tree that's already been made healthy by Jesus' grace, what he says is you are going to obey God. You're going to love him. You're going to produce fruit. It's going to happen. Now, perhaps the early reformer Martin Luther, perhaps he once said it best, or he said it second best. Jesus said it best in Matthew 7. But Martin Luther, he once wrote this very famous quote talking about the way faith operates in salvation. He once said this, we're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves, it's never alone. Now, that might sound a little complicated or confusing to people, but essentially what Martin Luther is saying is this, good works are never going to save you. Good works are never going to make God love you even a little bit more, accept you a little bit more. Only Jesus can do that. But what he's saying is that true faith is always going to be accompanied by fruit. And friends, that's God's purpose. That is his design. That is why the purpose and goal for why he has saved you. He didn't just save us for the sake of saving us, but friends, he saved us in order that we could become more like him. That's the goal of our salvation. And friends, if all of that's true, Again, the question is, what does this mean for our lives as Christians? Well, just a couple of quick applications before we close. First, what this means is it gives you and I a new motivation for holiness. See, for Paul, the question isn't really, and I I kind of set up a false dichotomy up there, but the question really for Paul isn't, are good works necessary for Christians or are they not? The most important question for Paul is, what is your motivation What is your personal motivation in your life for doing good works, for obeying God? See, the question really is this. Are you living the way that you're living? Are you doing all the things that you're doing in order to somehow change God's disposition towards you at all so that he'll either love you more, accept you a little bit more because you think he's going to bless you more, just take care of your life because you do all these things for him? Or are you doing the things that you're doing? Are you living the way that you're living because you know that God has already Change his disposition towards you because he already loves and accepts you so much. You know, a lot of us know as Christians, you know, this is, again, as we said in the beginning, very basic. A lot of us know as Christians that we are accepted by God because of what? It's all because of Jesus, right? But see, what happens, you know, later on in our lives as Christians is we develop this mentality and we live as if we have to now maintain that acceptance. You know, Jesus, he, he got us he got us out there. He started us off, but now it's up to us. We've got to maintain this. That it means if we sin a lot or if we don't obey God enough that somehow he's going to be upset, somehow he's going to revoke our acceptance, or he's going to stop loving us or blessing us. And friends, when we live like that, what you and I don't realize is if our only motivation for pursuing good works and pursuing God is either fear that we're going to lose something, we're going to lose God's acceptance or his love or his approval, or it's out of a desire to earn or get something from God, what you and I oftentimes don't realize is that if we're doing that, we're not really serving God at all. We're just serving ourselves. You're trying to save, secure something that you're afraid of losing, or you're trying to gain something from God. And friends, the only way that we can ever break out of that mindset is, again, if we first have a deep understanding of this relationship between our works and the salvation that God has given us. Now listen to what one former pastor once said. He once wrote this, and he said, In Christ you were accepted, but that acceptance no longer has to be earned or maintained. It's granted by grace and guaranteed in Christ. And what that means is it doesn't mean you stop working, but it means that you now work in a totally new way. You no longer work for approval, but you work from it. Friends, we have a new motivation for holiness because we no longer have to try and Get things from God. Get anything from God because we know that he's already given us everything in Jesus, our representative. That's the first application. Now, secondly and very briefly, what this also means is that every situation that you and I face in this life, every situation is an opportunity. What do I mean by that? You know, if we're honest, when life gets difficult, when, when life is just tough for you, where do our minds go? You know, when life is difficult, things seem like they're falling apart. We often feel like God has lost control, don't we? And that's why we question and we say things in our heart or in prayer to God. God, how could you let this happen? Why are you letting this happen to me, God? God, why didn't I get into that school or that job that I applied for? God, why did I lose my job? God, why did you put this person in my life? They're such a thorn in my side. Or God, why won't my kids obey me more? God, why won't my parents understand me more? 
Why are you letting all this happen? And friends, so often we forget the simple truth that God is not surprised by any of those things. He's never surprised by it. Look back at verse 10. What does Paul say in verse 10? He says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, what? Which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. And friends, what this, mean, what this verse means is this. It means that maybe, rather than signs that God has somehow lost control over your life, he doesn't have control anymore, maybe all those circumstances, maybe all those situations are opportunities. Maybe they're opportunities that God has prepared beforehand for you to grow in, to sanctify you, opportunities for you to turn to him, to depend and lean and rely upon him, and to make you more like Jesus. Now, friends, it doesn't mean that those things are going to be easy. They're going to be painless. But what it does mean is that in all circumstances, friends, it means that our God is very present, and he's very near, and he is very involved in our lives. Because his purpose in allowing us to go through the things that we go through is not to allow us to just suffer for the sake of suffering. But friends, it's to make us lean and depend upon the one who has suffered for us on our behalf. That is God's end game and his goal, to make us more like Jesus. And friends, once we understand that fully, only then we'll be able to live out the purpose that he has called us to, to be these new creations that God has created in Christ Jesus, made for good works, not because of our works, but as we remember that we were who we once were, we were once dead in our sins and trespasses. But when God united us to Christ by faith, we have been now recreated, friends. We've been given a new purpose to live for this God and the Savior who has given himself up for us. And friends, I pray that the more we reflect on that truth, the more that it will bear fruit in our lives as believers, that we could follow after Jesus, and we can give him our lives because he's already given us everything. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me?